John chapter 17 lecture, lesson number 22. Let's pray. Lord, we give you glory for that is who you are. You alone are glorious. You alone are worthy of our praise. And we pray now for a new revelation of yourself that we might glorify you all the more. We pray also that your Holy Spirit would guide us and help us to see the role of prayer in our lives. Use Jesus's model of prayer to grow our prayer life, to transform our prayers. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Well, in my church, virtually every worship service, we recite the same prayer. It's a familiar one to Christians or even to many unbelievers. The prayer comes from Matthew chapter 6. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. To us, that's the Lord's Prayer. But many Bible teachers over the years have pointed out that it really isn't a prayer that Jesus would have prayed. That prayer goes on to ask for the Father's forgiveness for sins committed. And since Jesus lived a sinless life, he could not pray such a prayer. No, Matthew 6 is really the Lord's model prayer for his believers, his disciples. The real Lord's Prayer is our text this week, John chapter 17. It is the most intimate and revealing passage into the relationship between God the Father and God the Son. It reveals what is important to God and why. And it reveals the manner in which God acts. He responds to prayer. And it's our goal for this lesson to know that God works through prayer to accomplish his purposes. We'll see that in Jesus' prayer. And if it's true for Jesus, it must be true for us as well. We need to be praying, men and women, if we are to accomplish his purposes in our lives. What is prayer? Well, very simply, it's talking to God. We speak to him in prayer. He speaks to us through his word. Prayer with God is a privilege, one that most of us fail to take advantage of. So let's look at this most intimate conversations and ask uh, the Holy Spirit to increase our desire to talk with God and to ask him also to transform our very prayer life. Chapter 17 is divided up into three parts. Uh, first five verses, Jesus' prayer for himself. And what we will learn in these initial verses is that our purpose is to glorify our God. And when that's our focus, God the Father answers our prayers. And then Jesus is going to pray for the 11 disciples, verses 6 to 19. And praying rightly leads to affirmative prayers and to, to affirmative answers. And, and, and we look at what God pray or what Jesus prays for. It is the spiritual protection and sanctification of his disciples. And then Jesus prays for all believers, including future believers, verses 20 to 26. You want to talk about connections. God the Son is praying to the Father for us. We're connected. And what does he want for us? He wants our unity with him and one another, and all of that for his glory. So let's open up our Bibles to John chapter 17. The phrase, after Jesus said this, uh, connects to John chapter 16. Having completed his final teaching to his disciples and having concluded with the encouragement to take heart, for he had overcome the world, well, then Jesus began to pray. Beginning in verse 1, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son will gl may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me. Glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus begins his prayer by addressing God 
as Father. Jesus' confidence in prayer came from his relationship, Father and Son. Jesus will refer to his Father multiple times in his prayer and sometimes calling him Holy Father or even Righteous Father. Here in BSF, we leaders are taught to pray in a specific order in our leaders' meetings. First, we praise God and glorify him for who he is. And then we thank him for all that he has done. And it's only after that that we finally conclude with our, our requests. Jesus changed the order. He made his request first, but it was appropriate for him to do so because he's God. In changing the order, his priority was still the same. He was glorifying God. He said, the time has come. Multiple times in this gospel, John had said, uh, Jesus' time had not yet come. But now it had. The most important event in all of history was about to take place. Jesus had obeyed his Father in everything he did, in everything that he said, and everything included God's timing. And what was Jesus' request? It was to glorify himself. An arrogant uh, request, if not for his divinity. Such a request looked forward to his final hours and days here on earth. It would include God's sustenance as he went through the agony of the cross. But it would also include his resurrection and his ascension and the restoration of his previous glory, that that he had before his incarnation. Jesus' request for glory was not just for himself, but it was also for his Father. An aspect of Jesus' mission was to reveal his Father to us. Hebrews 1 says Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. So when Jesus is glorified, so is the Father. Now what does it mean to glorify God? Well, theologians tell us that God's glory is inherent to him. It is who he is. The Hebrew word for glory means weight or heaviness. Jonathan Edwards is considered to be America's greatest theologian. And according to Edwards, the glory of God is the weight of all that God is. It's the fullness of his understanding, virtue, and happiness. Jesus, in asking for his Father to glorify him, was asking his Father to show the world exactly who he is, the Son of God. He was asking his Father to show the world that he was sent by God to redeem humanity and communicate to us. In that revelation, God the Father would also be glorified. The Father would be glorified through the execution of his plan. He'd given Jesus authority over all men that Jesus might give eternal life to those that the Father had given him. In verse 3, it provides a very clear biblical definition of eternal life. Jesus says that we may know God the Father, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you sent. There are different levels of knowledge. We can know that God exists. That would be a fact. We can know, even know about him. That would be more facts. But the knowledge that Jesus is speaking of is much different. The, the Greek word there is genosko, which, uh, it, which you know, theologians tell us is used in the New Testament, oftentimes to describe sexual intimacy. Jesus uses it in the present tense. And so what we're seeing here is a person who knows God in this way has an ongoing personal intimate relationship with him and his son. And that relationship is not a passing one. It's eternal. Everyone, believers and unbelievers, all exist forever, somewhere. Well, the important question is, where do we exist and with whom? Eternal life, uh, according to Jesus, is to be with God forever. And that relationship doesn't start off in the future. It starts right now. And the basis for Jesus' prayer is that he had completed the work given to him by his Father. And this assumed the obedience, his obedience, to, to death on the cross. It hadn't happened yet, but it was a certainty. 
And the Apostle Paul describes Jesus' work in his subsequent glorification in Philippians 2. We, we looked at that in our lesson. Verses 6 through 11 are considered the gospel in a nutshell. And they take us through his obedience to God, um, God's work, all the way from his initial humility and in taking human form, all the way through completion in the cross. And because of his obedience, his exaltation and authority over all creation, they um, are realized. Even though Jesus' prayer is for personal glory, these verses can still be an example to us. And so the first principle is that man's highest calling is to glorify God. One aspect of Jesus' mission was to reveal the Father to us. As disciples, we are called to reveal God to the world as Jesus has revealed himself to us. At the end of chapter 15, we saw that Jesus told his disciples they were to testify about him to the world. To reveal God to others as he truly is, is to glorify God. We do so through our words about him. We testify on his behalf. We glorify him when we exhibit his traits, when we are generous and kind, when we are gracious and compassionate. In short, when we are holy people, because God's holy. That's what the Westminster Shorter Catechism says is our chief aim. The chief aim of man is to glorify God and enjoy his presence forever. But glorifying God begins with prayer. By praying for God to be glorified in our lives, the Spirit transforms our hearts and we do glorify him. Prayer jumpstarts our hearts and minds, and then our words and deeds follow suit. So prayer is the key. So my question for you is, how are you glorifying God? How do you glorify him in your words to others? And how do you glorify him in your conduct? How do you glorify him in your heart? See, Jesus glorified his Father in all these ways. That's what he did because that's what he prayed, and that's our high calling. Now, beginning in verse 6, Jesus prayed for his disciples. He viewed his disciples as those given to him by his Father, not those who chose on their own to follow him. And for this reason, he expressed great confidence in their future. We pick it up in verse 6. Jesus prays, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. Those 11 were given to the Son by the Father. They were separated out from the world. And the word world occurs in this prayer 18 times. It means the realm of creation that is in rebellion toward God. Jesus' disciples were separated from the rest by the electing work of the Father, given to him as a, as a gift. They demonstrated God's choice by obeying God's word. Not perfectly, but they embraced Jesus' message and mission to the world. Having been given to the, by the Father, they knew Jesus was sent from the Father. Their commitment to Jesus revealed their trust in his unity, his union with the Father. Our value as disciples of Jesus Christ is not based on how well we obey God's word. Our value is based on who we are. You and I are sent uh, to as gifts from the Father to the Son, we are love gifts to him. So we ought to stop right there and ask ourselves, what kind of disciples are we? Are we disciples given by Jesus, given to Jesus by his Father? Or are we people who have chosen Jesus on our own? If we are inter-Trinitarian gifts, then there's great security for us. If we are the ones who are doing the choosing, well, I think our future may not be so bright. We occasionally see people leave the church. They fall away. And I suspect those are disciples of the latter type. 
But for those who are truly his, Jesus makes the first of two requests of his father in verse 9. We pick it up there. Jesus says, I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by, their pow by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by, the, by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. And then one more verse. And I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. That prayer, while, uh, while for the 11, I believe, still applies to all of us. See, Jesus prayed for his disciples' protection. He's not praying for the world. Uh, uh, for the world in its hostility uh, is hostile and uh, unbelieving toward it. The world will not be a preserved in such a state. It will be judged. But Jesus prays for his disciples because they are owned by God through his creation and through his election. Jesus prayed for his disciples because glory came to him through his disciples. They glorified him very simply. <laughs> they believed he was who he said he was. He was sent by, from the Father. He is God. And they acknowledged that truth about him. In the same way, we glorify Christ by recognizing his true identity, ascribing to him his true worth. Jesus would soon leave the world, leaving his disciples behind. They had to stay to execute God's plan of spreading the gospel. Because the dangers to Christians are numerous, the protection that Jesus provides then or prays for is multifaceted. Danger comes from within the church and from without. And one aspect of God's protection is from disunity. He prays that they may be one as we are one. That unity is in our common belief in God as revealed through Jesus Christ. That unity is patterned after the unity of the triune God. It is a unity of will and purpose. Just as Jesus did the Father's will and executed his purpose, so we must obey his will and purpose. In that way, we will glorify him. In this request, Jesus calls on the Father as Holy Father, God being holy. He is distinct and different from sinful creatures. His holiness is the basis for our separation from the world and our protection. And that protection comes by God's name. In the Bible, a person's name represents that person. As our good shepherd, Jesus protected his own. The 11, excluding the one doomed for destruction, they were protected. Judas was never one of those given to Jesus by the Father. And so ultimately, his true character was revealed. Jesus' motivation for praying this prayer in the disciples' presence is found in verse 13. He did so um, that, they, uh, that they and we might have the full measure of his joy. Hebrews 12 says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. After his resurrection, and especially after receiving the Holy Spirit, his disciples would recall his words, and they would experience his joy. Like the disciples, we should be joyous uh, over the words of this prayer. Having received God's word, the disciples were of much value to Jesus, uh, but, but in much danger from the world. So Jesus prayed for protection from the world in, in verse uh, in verses 14 on. He says, I have given them your word and the world 
has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not um, they are not of the world, even as I am not of it. His disciples were to be in the world, but to be spared from being overcome by the world. And, and, and that will be true for us as well. To the extent that we identify with Jesus Christ, we will be in the middle of the fight. But our high priest is interceding uh, for us that we might be preserved through the fight. Old Testament examples um, of this very truth include men like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men were spared from, not spared from conflict, a spiritual conflict in ancient Babylon. There in that pagan culture, God brought them through it. They didn't just endure it. God exalted them as he himself uh, was glorified through their obedience. Being separated from the world means that we are not part of it. The hostility toward God that fell on Jesus is going to fall on believers as well. And the more we are committed to him, the less desirable are the things and the desires of this world. They will be like rubbish. And the more we expose those false values and deceptive allures of this world, the more the world will hate us. In verse 16, Jesus prayed. His prayer revealed that believers are not just separated from the world, you don't belong to it. It's a strong statement. Having been born again, Jesus' disciples are citizens of the heavenly kingdom, and Jesus is our king. And because we belong to him, Jesus makes his second request of his father in verse 17. He, says, he prays, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them, I sanctify myself, and they too may be truly sanctified. To sanctify it is to be set apart for a special purpose, a sacred one. Jesus prayed that his disciples would be sanctified by his Father. Believers are set apart for the purpose of spreading the gospel. And to do that task, we have to be set apart from the world's values and goals and morals. The way we are sanctified is through God's truth, and God's truth is communicated through his written word. Many of us have benefited from being in Bible study fellowship. And there, there's nothing particularly magical about BSF. The benefits that we have received here come just from being exposed to God's word on a daily basis. As we read and understand God's word, through the teaching of the Holy Spirit, our hearts and minds are captured and transformed. Jesus was sanctified for the purpose of redeeming a people to God. And it's natural to wonder in what way was Jesus sanctified uh, other than that? Well, you know, he is God. He, he's already sanctified. Well, Jesus was sanctified in his carna incarnation for the purpose of dying for our sins. Only through his redemptive work can we be sanctified. He, he was sent into the world on this mission, and we were sent into the world on our mission. Verse 18 is John's version, then, of the Great Commission, which takes us to our next, next principle, and that is that Jesus secures and sanctifies those the Father has given him. Jesus' prayers are answered in the affirmative, because he always asks rightly. And guess what? He prays for us. The reason our prayers are not answered, it's often because we ask amiss. We ask for the wrong things, or we ask out of wrong motives. But Jesus' prayer for his disciples uh, is instructive. He prays for us for protection and sanctification. He prays for protection from division and influence from the world. He prays for sanctification by the truth. The truth of God then transforms our hearts and minds. And it is the realm of truth for which we are sanctified. We are to be in the world contending for the truth, presenting the Lord and proclaiming biblical principles to the world. 
So my question is this, how has the knowledge that we have been sanctified by the truth of God's word changed us? Are God's priorities our priorities? Are we being sanctified in the truth? To be sanctified is to be set apart. God has staked us out of the world to be his holy people. And that means being changed. That means change priorities, change desires, change thinking, changed everything. Now, <clears throat> beginning in verse 20, Jesus prayed for future believers, you and me included. All believers come to Christ indirectly through the ministry of the apostles. The next day, Jesus was crucified. His mission would be a success with his resurrection. And then 50 days later, he would send the Holy Spirit and the apostles would begin to share the gospel. They would share with those who would also come to Christ. So we pick, a, pick up his prayer in verse 20. He said, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you, and, just as you are in me and I am in you, May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. The same unity that Jesus prayed for the eleven, he prays for us. Again, this unity is unity with the Lord. It's very different from the unity that the world tries to attain. The unity of the world is accepting of one another, no matter what their beliefs. It's what they call tolerance. But as we have seen, the world's tolerance is intolerant toward the things of God. The unity that Jesus prayed for is a unity with God, as the triune God is unified. It is the unity of love for God. It is a unity of obedience to his word. It is a unity of commitment to his will for our lives. The only true unity comes through right relationships with God and Jesus Christ. Such unity testifies to the world because the world cannot duplicate it. The goal of unity then is to testify that Jesus' mission was indeed from God. The Father sent the Son into the world. The glory Jesus talks about in verse 22 is the glory of the cross. It will be the most important event in human history and the focus of our ministry in the world. The more we think about Jesus' atoning sacrifice for us, the more united we will be to his purposes. And of course, that unity is also due to the Holy Spirit indwelling within each of us. The ultimate goal for Christ is to have his disciples with him in heaven. See that in verse 24. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. The intimacy of relationship we have with Christ is currently dulled by the the presence of sin in our lives. But here Jesus requests the, that the Father grant us eternal fellowship with him to, to truly experience his glory. We experience Jesus right now, but the quality of our fellowship will improve immeasurably in eternity. John saw a vision of Christ's glory in Revelations 4 and 5. It transformed him. Uh, I, I've talked previously about the three aspects of salvation, past, present, and future. But here Jesus is teaching of that future aspect of salvation, that is glorification. The hope we have to one day be outside of the very presence of sin and in the very presence of the Lord. It's there that we'll see, truly see his glory. He had, it's the glory that he had prior to his incarnation. But when we see him, though, it will include the glory that he has received as our Redeemer. In Revelation 5, 
what did John see when he had a vision of the throne room? He, he, he saw the lamb looking as if he had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, all of heaven worshiping him because he alone was worthy to open the scroll. Not only will we see Christ's glory as creator, uh, but also his glory as our redeemer. Jesus Christ is the unique God-man. As Paul says in Philippians 2, that, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and in earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So Jesus ends his prayer by calling on his righteous Father. Those last verses, beginning 25. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. The Lord is right and the world is wrong. God exists and the world refuses to recognize him. Jesus, his son, knows his father and he knows believers who have been given to him by the father. We know him as well. It is to us that Jesus has revealed God. He continues to do us so as we study his revealed word and am taught and are taught by the Holy Spirit. And the reason for his revelation is that, is that his love will be in us. The motivation for God in sending his son into the world was his love. Love for us, and he wants us to have his love. And his person would be in our hearts. So the final principle is that Jesus unifies all believers to display his glory to the world. We believers... Um, uh, are those given from humanity by God the Father to his Son. We are given for our protection, instruction, and eternal security. And because Jesus cannot fail, you and I are secure in him. Not only that, but we are secure in his intercessory prayer for us. The glorified Jesus always gets his prayers answered because he always asks rightly. And he is asking for us. And Jesus' prayer is worth our serious consideration. Look at what he prays for. He prays for our protection and unity to display his glory. Protection? And yet, believers have suffered greatly throughout the centuries. So what do we make of his protective mercies? They do not promise easy or pleasant days ahead. I believe Jesus is seeking God's presence with us in our trials. As trials come, and they will, he is protecting us such that we will not be swept away. He will bring us through to the end. The best answer to prayer then is the presence of God in our lives and the acknowledge that he is there. So I ask you, how are you encouraged by the knowledge that the Son of God is praying for you and for me? And how are his prayers informing your prayers? We are privileged to have such a great advocate and that should motivate us to pray as well. And more importantly, his prayers should also transform our prayers to be more like his. And so we pray. Lord, you again are alone worthy of our prayer, of our of glory. You are creator, you are the redeemer, you are the sustainer of this world. We are nothing but creatures of wrath apart from you. We pray for hearts that love you, desire to talk to you, and grow in our glorification of you. We pray these things in Jesus' name.